to the great surprise of no one, this is about working safely in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. I'm doing general considerations, and I will try not to read the slides to you, but rather give you enough time to read them yourselves and um, add the odd anecdote as appropriate. So here's one where it's really important that the slides be posted on the website, right? On right? Okay, because nobody is going to remember this. The only thing to remember is where to look to find it, which is somewhere on the department website under general considerations. Okay, why is this relevant? Well, first of all, hopefully everybody has the campus dispatch phone number in their phone. Yes? 585-2677, cops. Okay? The next one is the link to the form if you have a work-related accident. Um, everybody is a, who's an employee is covered by workers' comp. Workers' comp happily pays to get you patched up, but they have to know that they have to pay. So if you go to Instacare, emergency room, wherever, to get something patched up, then you fill out the paperwork and you're on the hook until workers' comp calls them and takes over responsibility. So you have a keen interest in knowing, A, that you need to fill out this form, and B, where to find the form to fill out. Similarly, if you're involved in an auto accident, either driving the corporate limo, you all know the corporate limo, right? It's missing today, by the way. Uh, either with the corporate limo or driving your own vehicle on university business. Okay? Same deal. You need to fill out the form. And that's where you find it. Every lab should have one of these emergency response guides in it. You should know where it is, usually by the door, and at least flip through it to get an idea what's there. Yeah, exactly. Where's my laser pointer? Exactly. Okay? Um, Somebody needs to ask the obvious question. Where do you get them? We have Jensen. Good question. That's where it is. We have Oh. Heidi? There's a box of about a thousand. Where? In my storage room. Okay. So you get them from Heidi. Good. Moving on. Fire extinguisher. We're going to have a fire extinguisher training session one of these days. <laughs> Yes, and it's kind of funny. It, it's not quite as healthy as it looks. They have a simulated fire that you put out with a simulated fire extinguisher. And it's not quite, I've seen the videos at least, it's not quite as healthy as it looks. Anyhow, as I discovered one Saturday afternoon, um, a fire extinguisher operation is pretty self-explanatory. You pull the pin and squeeze the handle the important thing to remember about fire extinguishers is you point it at the base of the flame. If you point it up at the top of the flame, then it simply sucks more air and it makes the fire burn faster. Okay? Um, where to get lab supply, or first aid supplies, and stuff like that. Um, I forgot what's next. Oh. In a few slides, we have, I have made maps, taken the building maps for the three physics buildings and tried to locate in them where various emergency equipment is. So first aid supplies are various places around the department. That's what you look at on there. Uh, first aid must be self-administered. So much for my old William one. And that one's no better. Oh, alas. Um, first aid must be self administered. And it turns out you can't legally put a band aid on somebody else unless you've taken the bloodborne pathogen training, which, by the way, we're also going to schedule, right? Because one of the things that's in the kits, along with the AED, the defibrillator thingy, and the fire extinguisher, is a bleeding control kit, which we need to be trained on how to use. Okay. Know the locations of fire extinguishers, same deal, it's on the same uh, plot. The other little piece of useless information is if you want to use a respirator, you have to take the respirator training. You can't legally use a respirator. 
on campus without taking the train. Okay, automated external defibrillator. You see these all over. It turns out, well, the training, there's a bunch of them on YouTube. You watch the training on the YouTube, and it turns out that this thing is totally self explanatory. When you open the package, it tells you how to use itself. Okay? This is sort of like AI. Uh, and it's foolproof because one of the things that it does is it detects a heartbeat. If it detects a heartbeat, then it doesn't operate. Other than that, watch the video. It's, it's kind of cool, too. Okay, complete list of emergency. Complete is in, in um, quotation marks because I walked around all the buildings and took census on where the various pieces of equipment are. Um, for example, this is the first floor of JFB. There's a defibrillator and a fire extinguisher up in, outside in the middle of the hall there, just like it shows on the map. And so I went through all the buildings, wrote them all down dutifully. A couple days later, within a period of five minutes, I found three more fire extinguishers, one more of which is literally five feet from the door to my office. So, hence the complete is in quotation marks. Um, Heidi and I have worked out a deal. If you find any more that's not on here, turn the location into me and Heidi will give you a reward. <laughs> the only way. Okay, so here's, here's where they are on the second floor. Um, first aid kit is in, whose office is that now? McKaylee. McKaylee. McKaylee's office, the fire extinguisher is in the hall right outside, for example. So these are, once again, examples. Third floor of JFB, there's a fire extinguisher in the hall, I'm off station, a safety shower, and another fire extinguisher. Adam, have you got another relief one? Because I think there are two that don't work. Should be one in the box. <coughs> Oh, that's the other thing. It may not work much longer. Yeah, we all have that problem. Should you really be using those for the safety place? Safety? <laughs> <laughs> the train. Auto that one. Yeah. Okay, so you get the picture. Um, yeah. Okay, so electrical and RF safety. Electrocution. How does electrocution work, by the way? What electrocutes you? Answer. A current of more than 100 milliamps through your heart causes your heart to stop beating and you die. So, what are the fundamentals of avoiding electrocution? Oh, this one's cool. Uh, avoiding electrocution. Well, what are the two obvious current paths through your heart? Hand to hand and, and foot, yes? So if you're working around sufficiently high voltage, and numbers like, I just did the math on this when I was writing this up, by the way. It says here, um, the primary scale resistance uh, combined with the applied voltage determines the current pass through your body. Okay? So hopefully all of you are real physicists who've measured the resistance, skin resistance between your fingers, right? It's a couple hundred thousand ohms. Okay, so if you pick the random number 110 volts divided by 110,000 ohms, you get a 1 milliamp, right? And that's not there enough to kill you. That's why you, you get an electrical shock often and it doesn't hurt you. Okay, but if you increase the voltage or decrease the skin resistance, then you can be in big trouble. How do you decrease the skin resistance? Well, now we're on the anecdotes. Somewhere I read, must have been on the internet, so it must have been true, read about some kid doing a high school um, science fair project, and he wanted to measure effective electrical currents on the body. So being a clever scientist, he wanted to get good electrical contact. So he soaked his fingers in salt water, and the claim is he killed himself with six volts. Okay, so skin resistance is a big deal. Okay, what else? Other electrical hazards? Uh, reflex action. Yeah, there's actually two of these that go together. The reflex action can cause you to 
quickly remove your arm and bang your elbow into something important, okay? Or you burn out equipment, or you can get actual thermal burns from currents that don't go through your heart. Okay, what else? Wiring plugs. Um, let's skip this one, and I will simply effectively read it to you. So, how do you wire outlets and plugs? The answer is, the black wire always goes to the brass screw. The black wire, of course, is the hot one. The white wire, which is the neutral, which is at roughly zero volt potential, its function is carrying current back to the source. Okay? And it goes to the silver screw on either the plug or the outlet. <coughs> The green wire is the ground, and it connects to the case or chassis or whatever, the metal outer parts on which you're connecting, it goes to the green screw. Okay? By the way, people should be asking questions about things not clear. This is something important to know for all businesses, and if you don't, ask me out of that. Yes. I'll just add, that's not always true. I would check them. The uh, university electricians actually had this wired incorrectly before they remodeled and that color scheme they didn't apply to. They're clever, yeah. I actually had an employee once who was an electrical engineering student who decided that color coding was kind of optional. <laughs> Funny thing, he wired something up, plugged it in, and there went the breaker. So good point. Yeah. Trust but verify. Trust but verify. Michael? LED wiring oftentimes does not follow that color scheme as well. Really? So regular AC wiring, yes. LED wiring, oftentimes no. <laughs> what wiring did you say? Good to know. LED? Oh. Okay. Okay, moving on. We all, it's Friday night, we all want to go home. Um, <laughs> electrical equipment requiring a ground must be grounded. In other words, no cheaters. Everybody know what a cheater is? That's it, right? Three wires in, two wires out. Okay? Well, they put the three wire plug on for a reason. Horseplay, you know, this is like random stuff. Horseplay is strictly forbidden. And my favorite example of that, one of our, this is not sarcastic, one of our very safety conscious faculty members had his dog in one day. And he thought I'd seen the dog. This is how things go wrong, right? And I was writing something on the belt sander when the dog stuck its nose between my legs. <laughs> this qualifies as horse <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, what else? Um, microwave damage, right. If you work with microwaves, come back and read this one, and a lot of other things. Microwaves can be dangerous, right? They boil water. Where's a great source of water? In your eyes, okay? And if you go back, it says one watt per square centimeter, or milliwatt per square centimeter causes damage. Um, high voltage, be especially careful on metal ladders. This gets back to the one about reflexes. My uncle was an electrician from the old school. So one day he was on a metal ladder and got a thousand volts between his hand and his elbow. That was bad enough, but then he fell off the ladder hurt his back and his back never recovered from it. Okay, don't do that. Um, that I've already mentioned, avoid working in the labs and shops alone, especially when working with dangerous chemicals or equipment. If you insist on working alone, leave the door unlocked so that a passerby can see your lifeless body on the floor and someone help. And I just got the story from Ed yesterday about the graduate student here we still have the slide in about the graduate student, right? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> about the graduate student here who got his hair caught in the lead screw on the leg, which explained why he was still alive, because the lead screw doesn't go around very fast, and this guy's number was not up, because as it sucked him in, it pulled his shoulder against the lever that turns the leg on. Okay. Then we have the issue of his not lifeless body yelling help, I think this was on a weekend too, yelling help for somebody to come unravel it. Don't do that. Yeah, work in pairs. Bring a buddy. Okay, 
or don't work out after hours. Okay? Uh, on with the random stuff. Compressed gas cylinders. Always use a regulator for removing gas from the, from the gas cylinder and make sure they're chained up. <clears throat> because the next slide, and Adam has the whole video, right? Uh, Mythbusters. This is great. Um, see the hole in the cinder block wall that it went through before it hit the second wall? These are serious, unguided missiles. Okay? And I worked for a chemical company at one point where they had this overpaid truck driver who managed to tip, I think it was seven or nine chlorine cylinders off the back of the truck because he loaded them on the tailgate and then didn't roll the front and tie them up. So they all fell off the back and only like five of them had the valve to break off. So now you not only have, you know, chlorine doesn't have that high of pressure, but it is kind of toxic. Okay, don't do that. For transporting cylinders, you don't just roll them up the hall. You remove the regulator, put the bonnet on, and carry on the start. Okay? Uh, remove any grease before installing regulators. Grease and oxygen form an explosive mixture. Truly random stuff. Keep the hall doors closed in case of spill or fire. Well, get real. All of the hall doors are propped open all of the time, right? The take home message is when a fire alarm so sounds, remember to kick the blocks out on your way out the door, yes? So, this is one of our doors with prop, close up. Kick the prop out on your way out the door during the fire drill or actual fire, okay? This is what I just did the other day. Keep halls free of clutter, which includes ladders, tables, vacuum boxes, liquid healing doors, and etc. And actually, it's been worse than this. Um, if this wasn't the best day to take a picture, but we did have lots of clutter. Many rooms still have asbestos uh, ceiling tiles. Asbestos, no, no that's not good. Um, <coughs> the rule is avoid recreational ceiling tile moving. <laughs> Okay, if you need to move a ceiling tile to put a wire up, no big deal. Just don't make any more dust than necessary, or get a hold of Harold and find out if your ceiling tile has asbestos in it. There's actually money for remediation. Okay, more random stuff. No smoking anywhere on campus anymore. <clears throat> no eating or drinking in the labs with chemicals or radioactive sources. Belt-driven machinery must have guards, okay? There's no shortage of vacuum pumps around that don't have belt-driven pumps. Wear eye protection when handling chemicals, glassware, cryogenics, or working in the machine shop. Um, this is one of those, you can read as long as I can. Yes, I won't mention which faculty member used to ride a bicycle in the hall. Uh, burns. Um, the next slide, well, unwanted university must go to surplus. And the next slide is the official department burn center. If you get a relatively minor burn, nothing really serious, um, go to the burn center, which is on the east end. That's Naval Science in the background. East end of the third floor of JFB. Break off a uh, one of these stems and smear it on the burn. <laughs> you laugh, but it works amazingly well. An employee of mine one day had a con plastic container of propylene glycol explode all over his hand, and we ran down to Carlton's, who had a giant one of these in his office at the time, smeared it all over his hand, and then went up to the burn center. And the story was it was the old doctor and the young doctor, and they're what's this smeared all over his hand? Aloe vera, the old doctor, the one, old wives' tale. So we went back two weeks later, and they were both totally amazed at how well we healed. So it really, it actually works. Okay, ladders, use ladders only under the table. Hey, this is serious physics. Notice I got the fat guy. Okay, ergonomic, lift with your legs on your back. In summation, oh, you should take that. Um, in summation, 
always be cognizant of what you need to do to always work safely. Safe work practices, safe work safe equipment, safe work places. And I kid you not, I originally learned of Murphy's Law in the U.S. Army classroom, I think in 1966, and their application was, if anything can go wrong, it will, therefore, have a plan for dealing with the situation when things go wrong. Right ahead, who's next? 